Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 99 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Cannoli Fingers. And I'm joined here by my infamous co-host, former market maker, 20 years and current day retail trader, the man who used to work so hard that he took it as a compliment when his dentist told him he grinds in his sleep, the proper villain. JJ, how's it going? Good, brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. And our guest today is an independent, systematic futures trader, investor, writer, and research consultant, author of, tree, of three trading books, Systematic Trading, Smart Portfolios, Leverage Trading. And he's the author of a book that's on its way here shortly titled Advanced Futures Trading Strategies. Our guest's resume includes working for AHL, a large systematic hedge fund and part of the man group. Prior to that, our guest worked as a research manager for CEPR, an economic think tank, and traded exotic derivatives for Barclays Investment Bank. Of course, I'm talking about Rob Carver. Rob, how's it going? Uh, fine, thank you. Uh, I don't have any AKAs, I'm afraid. So just, just, <laughs> Rob, just Rob's fine, thank you. Just Rob for right now, Rob, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Uh, you know, as I said in the intro, you're a systematic trader. You write about systematic trading. I read that you learned to code at the age of seven. Uh, when I heard that immediately, Rob, I thought, one, I'm a bad parent um, and I need to get my son on this uh, ASAP. But uh, just I'm just interested in the, in, the, in the background on this. Just tell us a little bit about this. And, and what was that handheld device uh, that you learned to code on as well? Uh, so I actually learned to code on something uh, called the TRS-80 color computer, which uh -huh. has a massive 32K of RAM. Wow. I don't know if JJ is old enough to remember oh, those. I am, I'm 54, so I remember oh, those. Yeah, definitely. You're even even older than I am. Yep. Um, so, yeah, so I, 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 my parents bought it for me. Um, and I, I think if I'm being honest, my dad probably bought it because he thought he would you know, it's one of those presents that dads buy for the sons, <laughs> for themselves, maybe for themselves, perhaps, <laughs> possibly. But I, I, I kind of, you know, I think I got into it quite quickly, and he probably never even got to touch it, to be honest. So uh, he never really got any benefit from it. Um, so yeah, I, I learned to code in BASIC, which was the, the computer language that that was on it at the time, and then I had a succession of kind of small home computers. Um, and I think I put on my CV that I've learned and forgotten something like 50 programming languages since the age wow. of seven. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So did, was this something you immediately took a liking to, or do you remember? <laughs> do I remember? It's a long yeah. time ago. It's four over 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll am i be up front. I'm a nerd. I'm a geek, whatever, however you want to call it. So mm -hmm. I've always been good at maths. So it's something that, that kind of suits the way my brain works. Although interestingly, um, I did actually start doing a computer science degree at the age of 18, um, but I dropped out after a year because I actually decided that the sort of theoretical side of computer science didn't really interest me. I was more into the practical implementation of ideas and so on. So, uh, But yeah, it's obviously been very useful in my subsequent career to to be able to program. Um, and at the, the very least, it's, it's meant that when I've been working with teams of software engineers, um, I've been able to sort of kind of speak their language, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and understand what they're saying to a degree, um, even if my kind of actual code isn't what I would call professional quality. Mm, okay, interesting. I'd be interested to talk about a little bit more about that um, as we go through this. Uh, and I, so I guess, Rob, I guess a good place to really start here is just, I guess just with your background um, in, in finance, um, or I guess we can even take it before that. When, when do you first have interest um, in markets? Um, so we're going to go back to about the late nineties. Um, so I was, I was working in the middle East, which is actually where I was brought up in Dubai. Mm. Um, and, um, I was in a, I was having what I call my quarter life crisis. So I was in my kind of early mid twenties. And as I said, I dropped out of university, you know, wasn't really doing a job I particularly enjoyed. wasn't sure I wanted to do in my life. And I came across a, a copy of, of the infamous book, Liars Poker by Michael Lewis at a bookshop. Um, I read it and thought, well, this sounds interesting. Um, and um, so I went, I went, decided to go back to university and study economics. Um, and while I was there, I, I did an internship for AHL, obviously, who I subsequently worked for. Um, didn't end up working for them, ended up working for 
for Barclays for a couple of years. Uh, shortly before that, actually, um, so obviously this is kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s, tech boom and bust. Uh, I'd, I'd started trading on my own account, but literally, you know, like trading on what you might call the greater fool theory. So just buying nonsense IPOs in the expectation then the couple of weeks I would have sell that premium. So zero skill involved there. Um, and I actually also to fund my way through university, I was working part time for a um, stockbrokers in Manchester. Um, to begin with, I was just sort of answering the phone, but um, because I had, you know, software engineering experience, they, they I ended up working in a, a team developing an offshore trading platform, which was a kind of part-time student job is kind of quite cool, I guess. So, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so I did a couple of years in trading and um, I mean, you guys, I guess, are what I would call discretionary traders and uh, so that was my taste of discretionary trading and working on a trading floor and having lots of high pressure and stress and people shouting at you all day and and uh, I did not particularly enjoy that to be honest um, I found it um, mentally challenging but not intellectually stimulating um, and then I was lucky enough subsequently after I did my master's degree and did a couple of years in economic research to go back to where it shall um, and then I did a couple of things. The first thing I mean, they employed me to do was to uh, create a new, a new set of strategies for trading. Well, it was called systematic global macro. So, if you think about kind of big macro traders like, you know, Tudor Jones, George Soros, it was kind of systematizing, so trading the same kind of assets as them, um, and looking at kind of economic indicators rather than uh, just pure technical price systems, which is what the firm was tr traditionally known for. Um, and then in um, a few years later, I, I got promoted to run the, the whole fixed income portfolio. So that was about 40% of the risk on a $25 billion fund. So it was pretty, pretty big numbers. Um, and yeah, I did, did that till 2013 and then decided to to kind of go for a, an easier life. Uh, and since then, yeah, I've been trading my own money, writing books, doing a bit of teaching university. So um, so yeah, that that's my kind of three minute CV. All right. Awesome. Excellent. So just, just a quick uh, second to shout out to our sponsors of the podcast, Apex Trader and Top Step Funding. Any listener of this podcast that has the skills to pass an evaluation can become a prop prop trader fully funded by either Apex Trader or Top Step Funding. Our own micro e-futures trading community has many members who are now fully funded. No need to trade your own money. Keep 90% of the profits. To learn more, visit our website at microefutures.com. Uh Rob, I want to I want to ask you about your transition to uh, being an independent trader and trading your own money. But um, I just want to go back to your time working um, in finance. Uh, what was the difference? I, I assume you enjoyed working at the hedge fund a lot more uh, than at Barclays. Yeah, I did. Two reasons, I guess. Um, one is that, and this is kind of a stylized fact about the industry, it's a lot more fun working on the buy side than the sell side. Mm-hmm. Um, because um, you you kind of have a lot more freedom. Um, you're um, you know you're, you're making the if you ring the sell side, it's, they've got to be nice to you. Uh, there's there's <laughs> kind of a famous quote about that, which I won't repeat. Um, all right, I'll repeat a volatilized version of it. The difference in the sell side and the buy side is that um, the um, the sell side hangs at the phone and then says, you know, up yours. And the buy <laughs> side says up yours and then hangs at the phone because I can get exactly. <laughs> So um, it's not up yours in the original quote, as I'm sure I'm sure you guys know. Um, so so that was the first reason, and the second reason um, was was yeah, I, I just enjoyed much more the kind of systematic trading to the discretionary trading. So yeah. um, you know, there's it, it's an environment in which you can you've got time to think because um, just consider what you're doing. Um, you know, you can look at things in a more abstract way. You're not constantly tied to you know an endless cycle of economic announcements and customer flow, um, which is what I was doing before. So. Uh, it definitely suited my my strengths much more. Yeah, excellent. So so now you transition to being an independent trader, trading your own money. How was that transition? Did you have any reservations, fear, doubt, any anything like that? Um. Yes, I mean, it was a big step. Um, and to be honest, I I left, you know, AHL without a clear idea of what I was going to do next. Um, but one thing I did want to do, because I'd never done it before, was to build my own trading system stack 
entire stack. Whereas, you know, so work, what I'd done before basically was worked on the, what you might call the alpha generating piece of code, the bit of code that decides whether to buy and sell. Um, before that, there's a whole series of code that has to collect data, clean data, store data. And then there's subsequent code that has to, you know, execute positions and do risk management, all this kind of stuff. So as a sort of personal challenge, I did want to build my own system from, that would run from start to finish. Um, and, um, and you know, so that that was obviously, that took me a, well, took me about six months, um, which sounds impressive, but you've got to bear in mind, I had to completely rewrite it a couple of years later because it was a bit of a mess. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, and then obviously I was contacted by a publisher who said he interested in writing a book because I was blogging and my, he thought my blog sounded interesting. My background was interesting. Um, so I guess if I had fear, it was more of a, you know, what am I going to do with myself? Um, I don't really know what I want to do, um, but fortunately, you know, enough opportunities have cropped up that have made things interesting. I mean, I'd say that the, in retrospect now, if I, you know, the things that I miss from from my former life, if you like, um, mostly it's, you know, I was working with, I was very lucky to be working with some incredibly smart and also very nice people. Um, and that's quite unusual in finance. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you're lucky if you get one or the other and often neither yeah. um and now it's it's just me and my you know my office in the garden uh, most of the time although i do try and travel into london and meet people and occasionally i'm working with clients so i do get that intellectual stimulation but yeah that that's the thing i miss most i guess and um i think probably when i was about to leave you know leaving that kind of comfy office environment and going to the unknown it was a bit of a you know a bit a bit a bit a bit a bit worrying but but um the way i figured it i was quite quite young i wasn't quite 40 years old and the worst case scenario is i could always go back right so mm -hmm. you know but I, i'm probably too old and too grumpy now to go back to working in an office so <laughs> there we go yeah so uh, how was the transition too as well as um Cause like the account size is different, right? You were, you were working at a hedge fund. So I imagine you can't, um, you know, uh, use some of the same strategies. Um, things are going to change. How, how was it from the transition? Just, I guess, from that aspect, from like a strategy wise, um, and adjusting systems, or I guess creating a whole new system, um, in those respects. Yeah. So, well, partly the, the main thing that was different is in, in, so I trade futures, um, so futures have got a large contract size, although as we, as you guys, there's micro futures and mini futures as well mm -hmm. in a lot of places, but those aren't always liquid, unfortunately. Um, but you need a fair amount of capital to trade futures and you need a lot of capital to trade a fully diversified futures portfolio. It's the kind of systems I'm trading. You only really get a benefit, sort of re reasonable sharp ratio if you have a lot of diversification. So if you're just trading one or two instruments, you're going to have quite a low sh sharp ratio, a lot of idiosyncratic risk and kind of quite you know, your returns are going to have sort of fat tails and outliers a lot. You really need a lot of instruments to smooth those returns out. Um, and I, I kind of did a back of the envelope calculation. And I think to run what I would consider a adequately diversified portfolio, you need something like $50 million. Um, so before I had, you know, several billion, so that was fine. Um, and in fact, I was able to, in that previous environment, also access other instruments other than futures. So things like interest rate swaps, CDS, mortgage securities, things like that. That whole world has cut off from me because, you know, you need ISDA agreements and <coughs> teams of back off Definitely. people to trade those stuff. Yeah. Um, but but even in the future space, um, you know, my account's not $50 million. <laughs> Don't mind telling you that. Um, so my, one of my biggest challenges was actually coming up with a way to trade and to get the adequate diversification um, and to do that with a limited account size. Mm -hmm. um and actually it's taken me a few years to get it right but i've now got a sort of f fairly unique strategy that actually manages to do that um and a simple way of explaining it is like this essentially i run a kind of full 150 futures market portfolio synthetically um and then what i do is i every day effectively create um a, a sort of a, a, like think, think of it as like an index tracker that tries to track that portfolio but does so in the knowledge that I only have a certain amount of capital. So that, oh, you know, so okay. I go from 150 positions to perhaps 10 and I can manage that with my capital. So that, that's kind of how that works. Um, that was definitely the biggest challenge. Um, I mean, you know, in terms of, for example, speed of trading, I'm not doing anything differently than what I was doing before. Um, you know, it's not like, um, 
you know in a lot of cases strategies are capacity limited right so mm -hmm. Very true. reducing reducing account size improves things um for me for me i'm not really trading fast enough for that to be an issue so actually it's almost a straight copy in terms of uh, trend speed so, um, so it's pretty much just just down to diversification that's the biggest challenge i've had okay interesting um so yeah so so let's, let's discuss a little bit um your own system and i, and I guess just trading um in general um which i believe you share you you share your trading system on your uh website um which is awesome and it's a great website too uh, i'll let you plug it here in a minute uh, i suggest the listeners go and uh, read he's got a lot of good articles blogs um so how many how many strategies um are you are you running well it depends what you mean by strategy um, um <laughs> so let, let me so let me jump in mm -hmm. there um so um i effectively run a single strategy or i call it a strategy um but as i said that's made up of uh positions or potential positions in, in 150 instruments um in fact in a couple of months i'm going to increase that to 200 because i've just acquired a whole bunch of data um but the, and each of those instruments is then predicted by a number of trading rules. So I have about, again, about about 50 or 60 trading rules. So you, you might think that that's probably what you would call strategy. So for example, an example of a rule would be, you know, a, a breakout rule with a certain horizon. That's one, you know, one of those 50 mm -hmm. or 60 things that I'm trading. Um, so th those 50 or 60 things um, cover... Um, various kinds of so i'm I'm fundamentally say 60 percent a momentum trader there's two reasons for that firstly that's my background with ahl which is you know traditionally trend following fund um and um also because from a risk management perspective trend following momentum gives you sort of so-called positive skew a simple way of thinking about it is it's kind of got a built-in stop loss it will automatically get out of positions for you you don't need a, a separate stop loss there for the risk management so that that's a nice mm -hmm. property of it mm -hmm. um so i have look at lots of different ways of doing trend following breakout systems moving average crossovers moving average cro crossovers based on on normalized indices um moving average crossovers based on asset indices um relative momentum um and then i have um some carry systems i've got outright carry relative value carry i also have um systems based on things like um asset class mean reversion so for example if the s p has outperformed the nasdaq recently i would expect that to revert independently of what i think the trend is on either of them um i've got a skew system so it, that mean would mean for example if returns have been particularly ugly in an asset class recently that's actually a very strong bullish signal um, so if you get a light, some really horrible, horrible days, chances are that, you know, the light's coming at the end of the tunnel and you should go along um, and vice versa. So that, and that's, that's a skew system. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, I'm a, it, people often say to me, you know, what, what makes you good at what you do? And I actually say, well, mostly what I'm doing is, is collecting what, you know, kind of academic economists call risk premium. So I'm basically, there's lots of risks out there in the market that I believe are underpriced for various reasons. Could be behavioral reasons, could be because people can't access leverage, could be all kinds of reasons. And I don't, I don't really care what the reasons are, you know, as long as though empirically I see those premium there and I think they're going to persist, I'm happy to collect them. So what I'm trying to do with this portfolio of 50 or 60 trading rules and 150 instruments is to collect a diversified a possible of baskets of risk premium. Um, and then um, then the, the kind of the rest of the, you know, the quote unquote magic is down to things like, you know, having good risk of position management, having good execution, focusing on trading costs and, and this kind of stuff, which is like basically not making mistakes. Um, so, you know, my cynical view is I actually have no skill at all. I've no alpha at all um, because what I'm doing can be replicated by anybody. And, yeah, you literally can download it off the Internet. Um, but, but what I'm doing essentially is taking on a lot of risks you know it's not like i've got a kind of information edge or anything like that um i'm just collecting in a, a safer way as possible and an efficient or as way as possible from a transaction cost perspective a massive diversified portfolio risk premium mm -hmm. nice awesome i love it and um you you mentioned um time horizon a little bit before uh what's a typical trade what what are we looking at time time wise so that will depend on the the instrument I'm trading. So the more expensive an instrument is, the longer I'm going to hold it for. Okay. Sure. So let's take a couple of extreme examples. So something like, um, I don't know, NASDAQ futures. 
um, or S and P futures, uh, and it doesn't actually matter whether you look at the mini or the micro. The costs are similar. They're incredibly cheap to trade, mm-hmm. um, and you know I, I could happily trade them. You know, by the kind of maximum speed of trading them, those would be every couple of days potentially. In practice, though, I I don't have any systems that work that quickly. So in reality, you're looking at a holding period of perhaps a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, and at the other extreme, you'd have something like, um, well, some things are so expensive I don't trade them at all. Um, but if if you take something like I don't know euro dollar futures, and I mean the interest rates, not the uh, FX rate when I say euro dollar, they're pretty expensive. Um, with those, the holding period is more like a month and a half to two months, something like that. So it's in that range of between a couple of weeks and a couple of months. Okay, excellent. Okay, so so Rob, um, I'm not nearly uh, remotely sophisticated um, as you. I, I wouldn't even really consider myself um, systematic, but I do do back testing. I I try and you know just look at the data, but I do the execution myself and you know try and back test some ideas and stuff. And I think at times it can be hard um, putting the strategy um or or back testing what you're looking for um in a strategy and i know other people c- can get overwhelmed um with having an idea and trying to go and look at it um and you know test it um do you have any just quick tips or advice for uh people doing that um i mean the, the way i like to think about it is back testing is kind of a um a sort of a bad thing but we have to do it mm-hmm. so we should do it as little as possible um, and I'm trying to think of a of an analogy that, that won't get me into trouble with my wife, and I can't think of one off the top of my head, so I won't. <laughs> um, but but um, so yeah, the idea is you've got to sin a little bit, but don't don't you know sin as little as possible, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you know, one way of doing that is is um, to reduce the number of possibilities that you're looking at. Sure. Um, so an example from my own system would be, um, let's suppose I was trying to find the optimum pair of a moving average crossover. So moving average crossovers, two moving averages, say, you know, and you basically look at the difference between them, fast, minus, slow. And if the fast has gone over the slow, then that's an indication of a bullish uptrend and vice versa. So that's two parameters you've got to fit. So a way of reducing the number of parameters you consider is by first of all saying, well, what I'm going to do first is fix the ratio between those two numbers. So instead of testing, you know, 20, 21, 2022 2023 2024 and so on and so on and so on you say well i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna set the ratio between those two numbers at two or maybe three or maybe four um and then that's obviously means i've, I've now effectively got one parameter i've got to fit which is the you know the actual length and it, and it turns out the best thing to do is actually to use a variety of these things rather than a single one and using a variety of systems rather than a single one is another way to avoid you know effectively overfitting or curve fitting and that's why i say i've got 50 or 60 of these things um, Mm -hmm. because i want to have as many as possible partly because of the diversification benefits but partly because that makes the system more robust um so if you know one of them's not working i'll trade another one um another i'll make me making money from another one and and so on and so forth um the other thing you really want to avoid doing a lot of my advice is very negative, sadly, because I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that that most traders are better off trying to avoid making a bunch of stupid mistakes, uh, <laughs> and then when they've kind of got that sorted, then they move on to potentially, you know, adding alpha. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I, the in terms of back testing, you know, and overfitting and avoiding curve fitting. Um, another thing you really want to do is avoid, you know, looking forward looking data. Sure. So when I do my back tests, I'm I'm basically um, rolling through the data, and so at the end of year one in my back test, I say, well, okay, I've got one year of data. I'm now going to fit my system based on that. I then run it for a year based on those parameters. Now I've got two years of data. I refit based on those parameters, and so on and so forth. By the end of it, I've got 40, 50 years of data, mm-hmm. um, and I use all my data because I believe it has. I, I don't believe that things have changed significantly over time. So mm. I want to use as much data as possible, which means I, you know, I can get better statistical significance on my, on my fitting. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, generally speaking, do as little fitting as possible, never use forward looking data. Um, and, um, make your system robust by 
combining lots and lots of different things rather than saying, yeah, I want to pick the, you know, it always, always surprises me how many people just trade like one, well, particularly trade one instrument, you know, they just focus on, and I can understand why this is appealing. And as a discretionary trader, I can understand why you, you don't really have any choice, right? I mean, it's hard to, to focus on more than one graph on your screen at once, which is fair enough. But as a systematic trader who's fully automated, I have the luxury of trading as many things as I want. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, I'm going to get the maximum diversification and the most robust system by not saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to backtest all my different instruments and pick the 10 that did the best in the backtest. Because, you know, that that's not going to be predictive. Um, and if I look at the, the sort of statistical difference between those different systems, I actually find that, yeah, my maybe the, in the backtest, my NASDAQ is much better than my S&P. But if I look, if I do a statistical test of those returns, I find there's not actually any difference between them. And then what that's telling me is that in the future, I should trade both of them rather than just picking one. Um, you know. mm -hmm. uh, you, you said, um, I, I like um, when you bring up like mistakes and it's like the, the avoidance of making mistakes in a, you know, I grew up playing uh, football, well, a, a American football, Rob. Um, and uh, it makes me think like, that's a lot of times what coaches would stress, like, we're going to win by not making mistakes. We're going to be the team that makes the least mistakes. And, and I think that just makes a ton of sense. Um, yeah. And, so and, and yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my, so my, my main sport is sailing. And um, there's a, there's a really good book called mental and physical fitness for sailing. And then he says, he describes a race as being basically like, imagine you're on a, like a, an, um, an escalator, you know, so a moving staircase um, that's moving against you. Um, and you have to kind of step up the stairs one at a time. Okay, at the end of the race, the person who's highest up will be the winner. It's likely to be the person who hasn't tripped over as much, right? So every mm -hmm. time you make a mistake, you're tripping over, you're tripping over, and you're getting pushed down. So it's it's less about, you know, being able to run up the stairs faster than anybody else. It's more about making fewer mistakes. Um, and yeah, the the although I've talked purely about backtesting, um, you know, the kinds of mistakes that I like to avoid and this applies to all traders and because the other the other two big things that people do badly um and it, and in this country you know we have when we advertise stockbrokers and and um you know spread bets and so on they have to put in big writing x percentage of retail traders lost money while using our platform and that figures normally 70 75 80 85 90 percent and the reason those those people are all losing money is they're either losing money too slowly slowly bleeding their account dry because they're trading too frequently and they're paying out too much in commissions and spreads. Or they go out in a blaze of glory because they've taken on too much leverage and they've blown up. Exactly. Um, so th those are the kind of two, you've got, you've got to, all traders should avoid those two big errors. And then eventually they start to think about anything else. Uh, and yeah, systematic traders should also avoid overfitting their systems and avoid the mistakes I've discussed. I want to just jump in real quick there on spread betting because I, I've been in England for a year now and, and you know I've seen quite honestly the devastating effects of this spread betting on on retail traders. Uh, basically, in, in essence, uh, you know they're bucket shops. You'd actually have nothing to do with the un, underlying instrument. You're just betting on price. And what I notice is the ease at which people can move money from their bank account to these spread betting accounts. So they'll get into a position, they'll get locked into a bad position, and then they'll drain their bank account to prop that position up and never cut their risk. And I see that happen over and over and over again. Whereas in a futures market, you've got your day trade margin and you know, you've got 15 minutes before the close of the day to get the heck out of that position. Otherwise, you've got to put up a lot of money and it takes a long time to wire money into that account traditionally in the United States. I mean, back in the old days, heck in Canada, you still have to go into a bank to send a wire. You can't do it electronically. You have to walk into a bank, physically do a wire, and it takes two days to get there. So I think that way, you know, the futures market helps people manage the risk, even though they don't want to. But I see this spread betting, you know, it's, it's like a plague with these traders, um, you know, that they just, it's, you know, they're just holding on to positions and just transferring money in to hold these positions until they finally blow everything that they have in their savings. I've seen it so many times uh, and over trading as well. I mean, not just that, but the over trading that you mentioned, but the, the, the ease at which, um, and I think it's the culture here too, because, you know, on every corner, there's a Ladbrokes and, uh, you know, and there's a, like betting parlors on every corner here. 
it's it's um you know it, it's like the mob has taken over this place you know back <laughs> it, it's seriously i, I don't i don't yeah. see uh, there's like you know there's the fca and things like that but i don't i don't think they have any teeth um, yeah. you know it's just it, it's just amazing how uh rampantly corrupt this is and and uh, so I just, you know, I, I just wanted to throw that in. All these people, like, that's why I tell them, just get off that stuff, open a proper futures account and learn how to manage your risk and cut losses. Um, yeah. So um, I, you know, there, there's definitely an, an issue here with in this country with problem gamblers, absolutely. Um, it's, and there's a lot of gambling adverts on TV and stuff. And there's kind of a big crossover between the, you know, the spread betters and the, um, the, the sports gamblers. The sports betting industry but also the crypto industry which is right oh yeah it's just yeah. A, a branch of the gambling industry yeah um i mean one one piece of advice i, I like i like you you talking about people topping up their account because one piece of advice i like to say to people is if you think you've got a hundred thousand pounds of trading capital that's what should be in your broker's account don't just put ten thousand in um and say well if i make it if i lose money i'll just top it up because you you end up just getting used to topping up your account and it's like a slot machine you don't know how much you've lost or gained yeah. Um, I will. I do feel I should not defend the spread betting industry slightly, but at least to say that, you know, I mean, I've written a book about about how to sort of safely use um, leverage in general. So that in, and includes spread betting in CFDs, because in, in this country, you know, most retail traders probably don't really even heard of futures. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, they don't have the sort of account size necessary to trade them anyway. Um, but but, um, the, you know, that like a lot of things, they are fine if used properly um and um you know there are certain spread bets that are a lot more expensive to trade than others and there are also spread betting firms who are more honest than others and it comes down to how they hedge their positions so um you know a firm that doesn't hedge at all is basically a bucket shop because they're just yeah. on the other side of the trade from you exactly um yeah. whereas a, a lot of firms do actually you know effectively continuously hedge their customer exposure so um you know that that with, with futures obviously so they're kind of aggregating up the spread bets and passing on to the futures market and that's seems like a reasonable business all and it you know i think it's a, a if you know what you're doing and you're not in, that you know um it's a reasonably good way to to trade although it's it's always going to be more expensive than futures but it's a reasonably good way to trade with less capital yeah, um, yeah but you now know, that now are that not being sensible so yeah, now that they have the micro, I mean, you you can trade the micro for you know thirty to fifty dollars per contract um, at a lot of the firms in the U.S., which is you know uh, in pounds that's you know uh, that's even less. Um, so that's why we we try and transition people to to that and try and get them to actually, like you said, learn what you're doing before you think about making money. Try and lose as little as possible until you figure out what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I, I've just I'm just. Uh, I, I've just been exposed to it over and over again here with the, the CFDs and the spread betting. And, and I guess I, I don't really know which firms are reputable and, you know, which ones that are laundering money for human trafficking there. It's, it's a fine line because, you know, some of those firms, you know, once you go to Cyprus and these kinds of places, things get very, very murky, um, you know? I, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I personally would never trade with an exchange that wasn't properly regulated in the UK. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, anyway, Ray's looking nervous. I think we're getting a bit oh. off topic here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. No, Oops. no. It's we, uh, Rob. I'm pretty sure we we've talked about much worse on this podcast. <laughs> before, <so. laughs> but um, uh, Rob, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, in the beginning of the conversation, uh, you mentioned when um, I, I think you were discretionary trading at first. It wasn't intellectually stimulating, but it was mentally very challenging. Do you, um, I kind of want to just ask you about variance within your own system, um, because a lot of trading is, you know, like you mentioned, especially for a discretionary trader can be very tough mentally. Um, am I, is it my system that's bad? Is it my trading strategy that are bad or am I unlucky taking a systemized approach? I'm sure it, it helps take away some of the emotions, but maybe if your strategies are performing poorly, maybe for a week, a month or whatever, how do you, I guess, just deal with variance uh, mentally? And then I guess also uh, as a follow-up question, how do you know if it's your system or maybe it's just bad luck? I'm actually going to answer the second question first, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think one thing that really helps is a, a, a good understanding of what the likely, and I, I, I have a term for this, I call it the envelope of behavior. So it's a term taken from aviation. Um, the, the envelope, flight envelope is the sort of expected, you know, the, the, the air in which it's safe to fly a plane. So if you if you try and push a plane into too steep a climb, for example, outside the flight envelope, it will stall. 
Um, so the the system envelope for a training strategy would be could be something like you know, well, I don't expect to lose more than you know five percent a day once a year. You know that's an example statistic you can you can bring out. And the nice thing about about back testing is it allows you just produce those statistics automatically. Um, and um, and then and then with that in in mind, then when you actually come to run your system in live trading, um, it's really helpful to know that. Okay, yeah. I'm, let's say I'm down five percent this week, but actually, that's that should happen about one in every four weeks, say, as an arbitrary example. So that helps a lot with the the sort of psychological side of things, definitely. Mm. Um, and even if you're not a systematic trader, as long as you've got some kind of realistic idea of what your performance is likely to be, you can actually, with the right statistical tools, generate these kinds of numbers yourself as well. Um, and I think it's my third book. I show people how to do that as well. Um, so the to, so what the problem so well know when it's my system when I go outside that envelope so let's say you know or let's just take drawdown as a simple example because it's a statistic most people are familiar with um, let's say my the largest drawdown I've ever had in my system in the back test is thirty percent once I go beyond thirty percent then I it's you know then actually that's, that's interesting um, if I've got a fifty year back test and I've never gone had a drawdown bigger than thirty percent I'm now at forty percent. There's a strong possibility that that um, either my my back test is not robust and is overfitted and is too optimistic, or that the 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 sort of effect I'm picking up on when I'm making money has gone away. Okay, one one of those two things is true, um, and in either case, I potentially got a problem, right? So as long as I'm inside that envelope, I'm generally quite relaxed. Um, I say generally because it's just human nature when you're losing money to feel bad and when you're making money to feel euphoric. Mm -hmm. The main advantage of being a systematic is it's very hard for me to do anything about those emotions. Um, it's very hard for me to kind of go into my system and start meddling with it. Um, mm. It's it, you know I could start changing parameters arbitrarily, but but um, that's not necessarily going to improve things. Um, and actually, I, I find it now much easier to to leave my sister alone and not to tinker with it than I did when I was working as a professional trader because um, I no longer have this sort of dual conflict of the fact that it's supposed to be a system that you're trading but also you have fiduciary duty not to lose people's money um, and that that's you know so if you let's say you have a strong feeling that making some change to the system would it would prevent it from making losses should you then go ahead and make that change even though the system is supposed to be systematic there's, a, there's sort of a conflict of interest there um, I don't have that conflict of interest anymore because it's my money, um, and mm -hmm. you know I've got no 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 worries about losing it. Um, well, that's not quite true, but you know <laughs> <laughs> I would only have myself to blame. You know, there's no one I can exactly. see. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so um, so that helps as well. But there are other things as well. Like for example, I try not to look at my PL in in cash terms. Look at it in percentage terms. That's a good advice for anybody, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I try not to look at my PL too frequently. Um, although I'll be honest, if the market's moving a lot, it's kind of a bit hard not to. Um, so if you take, say, you know, eight, 11 months ago when things, the kind of commodities markets were going pretty crazy because of the start of the war. Um, and, um, you know, I, my strategy was making a new high watermark every day. There's a certain satisfaction in watching that happen in real time. And there's, uh, you know, the reverse is true if you're, if you're losing money. But, um, but yeah, fingers crossed. I've been trading my own money now for nearly, um, eight years over eight years something like that and um so far its performance has been well within my my so-called envelope so i've i've not had any concerns mm -hmm. excellent how, how how often are you actually watching the market during the day do you even watch it at all or you just come maybe at the end of the day check things out um so what ordinarily um i basically get my system sends me a series of emails every evening saying okay these are the trades you've done um, this is the slippage on those trades. Um, this is the risk you're currently running. Um, here's a list of all your positions. Here's a bunch of checks to make sure that various things have run when they should have run. Here's a bunch of checks to make sure that, um, you know, for example, I've reconciled all my positions with what the broker thinks my positions have. Um, you know, so it's 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 a sort of status and checks and balances. Um, and most of the time I, I can spend about a minute looking at those reports and then close them and ignore them. Um, so um, I, I've also, I mean, I'm an extremely lazy person. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, probably the main reason I'm not a very good discretionary trader is I'm far too idle to spend my, my life looking at a screen all day. 
uh, and I've great respect for people who can do that. I have to say, um, so I, I've I've used my programming ability to automate everything as much as possible. So I have to do the absolute minimal amount of work, um, you know, on an everyday basis. Now, that, of course, that means I'm spending a lot of time programming, but I, I enjoy programming, so that's fine. Um, and it's it's not a pressure situation. It's not like I need to I need to write the code now. Whereas, of course, if I was on discretionary trading, I'd, I'd need to do the fill now. Um, so it's uh, it's a, a lot less stressful, um, even if arguably I spend as much time programming as I would do trading if I was trading in front of a screen. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, Rob, I think your your take on profit target or maybe a lack of a profit target. Um, I think it's a good for a discussion because I know this may differ or does differ from good amount of people um, or maybe some of the general trading uh, stuff that gets pushed out. Uh, why are you generally not a fan of profit targets? Um, so just to be clear, are you talking about a profit target in a position or a, a kind of I want to make $300 a day profit uh, target? Pro profit target in a position. Okay. Um, so the the reason is it part of the reason is that my system is not set up in the kind of what I would call a, a discrete way. So a discrete system, which most people are familiar with is something like buy here and then hold position until one of some, uh, some things happen. Um, either the, you lose money, a certain amount of money with that's a stop loss or you make a certain amount of money. And that's a, a profit take. Um, my system is not built like that at all. As, as I said earlier, it's, it's about, continuously evaluating uh, a set of forecasts on markets and then adjusting my position accordingly. So when I said earlier, I would typically hold a euro dollar position for an average of say two months in practice during those, that's an av that's going to wait at average. So it might be actually my, I would be holding a long for years potentially or a short for years. Um, but, but that, that I'm, I would be constantly trading around that long to the extent that my weighted average holding period will work out a couple of months um so that that's one reason why the other the other reason why is that um for a trend follower someone who's doing a trend following style of trading it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have a, a profit take because you just don't know where the market's going to go you want to stay in a trend until it finishes and the trend will, will be finished when you hit your stop loss if that's what if you're doing it that way or for me if my forecast reverses sign um but you know if you set up a, a, a profit target to begin with then chances are you you know you're going to see the thing going to go from you know fifteen hundred dollars to two thousand dollars okay i've got my five hundred dollars profit in my back pocket i'm out of position you know three months later it's gone to four thousand dollars okay um whereas a trader who's just using a stop loss would have would have stayed in that trade all the way until gave back the point that they got out of their stop loss um, now, if you're doing a, a sort of mean reversion style of trading, which is which would be something like, let's say you think the fair value of an instrument is a thousand dollars, and you're going to buy if the price is below that and sell if the price goes above that, well then profit take makes sense, right? Because if you buy eight hundred, well you're going to sell at a thousand. That's the sa implicitly the same as having a profit target at two hundred dollars. Um, so it would make sense in in that in that sense, but but on the other hand. If you bought at seven hundred, then your profit target would be three hundred dollars higher, a thousand, a thousand dollars. So, I wouldn't actually, even if I was doing mean reversion trading, I still wouldn't use explicit profit targets because um, that's not the way I trade that system. I trade that system by you know, buying below a thousand and selling at a thousand, rather than having a specific amount of money in mind to trade. I mean, the the idea behind profit targets is is um, I think emotionally people like them because it allows you to to write this really neat formula where you have you know. Um, stop loss, profit target, expected um, percentage, pro you know, expected percentage positive trades and work out what your distribution of trades look like. Um, mm. But to be honest, you know, that that's um, all it all is going to do is is potentially transform your system from one that has a um, to one that has a small number of profits, and, uh, you know, small profits and then a few big losses, which is a the kind, you know negative skewed strategy. And that's not the kind of strategy I like to trade. So, yeah, not a fan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really like that. I, um, I definitely, I took that out of my trading a while ago, um, the profit targets. And then I, um, I've had the pleasure of, um, having lunch with this gentleman a few times. Um, he, he was a, uh, longtime analyst on wall street, Walter Deemer was his name. And he, he has a book of just like real simple 
quotes, um, but there, there was a lot of a lot of nuggets of wisdom in them. And he he always said that we we always underestimate how far a stock can either go up or down. Um, and that that really stuck with me. And I was like, you know what? That's that's so true. And by putting a target on things sometimes is like it just it feels suboptimal um at times. Um, and so I like that a lot. Um I know AI is really hot right now, Rob. Um, I know you have some thoughts on AI um, and its place in trading. You want, you want to share with the listeners? Yeah, I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, which may surprise people who don't don't know me very well, because you would assume that self confessed nerdy, geeky, systematic trader would love love this stuff, right? So, um, someone who's obsessed with computer programming. Um, I, I guess I have a couple of objections. The first, the first is that um, although you've you described my trading as complicated, actually, it, it's more like a, a a large number of things that are relatively simple. So I, I could explain to you any one any one component of my trading system in about three or four minutes. You know, okay, I'm trading. You know, micro ES, twenty day breakout. You know. That that's the forecast, and then here's how I do my position and risk management. That might take a bit longer, okay. And once I've explained that to you, I could then do the same for all of my instruments, all of my trading rules. So ultimately, um, it's it's possible for me to understand. I can look at any trade that I've made and kind of work backwards and see and see and understand how that trade came into being. Yeah, I can I can say, oh yeah, look, it's because the this particular forecast has done this. And that's done that because this price has done this. You know, it's all it, it can be explained. And um, although it is com- large and complicated, you know, um, as a as a joint model, that means that I can intuitively understand any every single component of it. Now, any any sort of complicated artificial intelligence, neural network, genetic algorithm, all of these sort of techniques involve black boxes. They you know they're true black boxes. It's it's almost impossible to to understand the relationship between the inputs going in and what's going out, um, and and to me that's that's dangerous and 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 it's not something I'd want to do. And I I question people who do it with other people's money, to be honest, because I I, I think um, to me it's a little bit irresponsible because you 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 need to be extremely disciplined in terms of um, having really good tools to understand how these things are working. Um, and the other the other issue is I've talked earlier about robustness and overfitting and curve fitting of trading strategies. Um, now the way I do my fitting means that it's it's very obvious when I'm overfitting. Um, it, but where but that's because the, the fitting techniques I'm using are relatively simple. Again, you might find them complicated, but to me they're simple. Um, and compared to artificial intelligence, you know they're they're like a pocket calculator. You know it's just they're they're incredibly basic. Um, but because they're simple, it means that I I know when I'm doing using them badly, when I'm sinning a little. Going back to that earlier statement, um, and I know and I know you know when when I sin too much with artificial intelligence, that's just not true. Um, with these other other techniques, it's really really hard to know. Um, it's really much easier to slip into a, a path where you're just overfitting what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the, the 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 big number one reason why I don't like them. Um, in addition to that, I'm quite skeptical of their ability to actually work. Um, so in, in my experience, one of two things happens when you throw these more sophisticated techniques at financial market data. You either end up recovering what the simple system does anyway, because, you know, if you take, say, a diversified index of futures markets, then, yeah, the momentum with a three month look back is usually the strongest effect you pick up. You throw the artificial intelligence at it, you know, you throw months of work at it and you get the same answer. <laughs> As a simple simple system, which you know is is a bit of a waste of time, um, and at the cost of all the things I've discussed before, um, that's one. And the other thing that will come out is it will say actually, if you buy on the third Wednesday of every month, three o'clock, and sell exactly two hours and seventeen minutes later, you'll make money every time, guaranteed. So basically, it's just massively overfitted and just come up with a completely spurious result that's irrelevant. Mm. Um, now that's not to say there aren't people out there who can do this stuff and do it well. Um, you know, and, um, I know people who are using, um, machine learning, which is a sort of, again, adjunct technique to AI, um, in, in, um, in things like high frequency trading, where there's a lot more data 
which means it's a lot harder to overfit. Sure. So if you really, really know what you're doing and you're really, really good, there is a limited amount of value in these things. Um, but um, I'm, I'm n- n- neither of those things. Um, so uh, for me personally, I'm, I just rather stay away from it and stick to what I what I know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would I would advise 99.9999% of the people listen to this podcast to do the same. Uh, and those of you who who you know are going to be okay with the stuff, you'll hopefully know who you are. And please go ahead and make a little bit of extra money with the stuff that I personally can't do. I'm happy for you to go ahead and do that. Yeah, absolutely. And they're probably if they are, they're probably not listening to this podcast. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've got a, a small hardcore fan base who listen to everything I do, so you never know. Oh, excellent! Shout out to them. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, Rob. Um, let's see. I got a, cu- a couple more things for you. Then get you on your way, man. Appreciate your time. Um, I know. I know you get contacted. Um, you know, emails, DMs, etc. Um, you know, you got a lot of books. I'm sure the novice traders asking you questions. What What are some of, I guess, maybe some of the common mistakes or thought processes you see from um, you know, new independent traders. Um, I tend not to get too many emails from new independent traders, maybe because I'm a bit scary, a bit intimidating. I don't know. Um, a, a much better answer actually is so I, I teach I teach um, students on a master's course mm-hmm. um, at University of London, and um, you know they tend to be much less experienced. Um, and, and at the end of every lecture, I say if anyone's got any questions about not about the syllabus but about trading generally, please feel free to ask me those. So yeah, so quite often they're, they're they're making the mistakes I've already talked about. So, okay. um, you know they've they've, you know, so the nice the, the scary thing now is you can get commercial software that will do back testing for you, um, and it, you're able to use it without any real understanding of what it's doing. And what's really worrying for me is you can say you know you can you've got a drop down menu of fitting techniques and it will be and there'll be one there and it'll, yeah pick and they just go through them picking the one picking the one that gives them the best result, which is a, another form of fitting effectively and they'll they're like oh, i've got this amazing result professor what do you think and um you know so so i i do th- it's yeah. the mistake most people make is they start too complex um so the advice i generally give to people is and this is in my third book start with training one instrument you know and it should be something that a is cheap to trade and also has a relatively small amount of capital and you guys are talking about the micro ES and that pretty much ticks those boxes. If you can trade futures, then there's probably no better futures to trade. Um, and then trade that with one trading rule. So I talk about 50 or 60, but start with just one um, and have some sensible techniques of position and risk management. And then mm-hmm. just get an understanding of how that works. And once you've got that, then you build out from that. And that and that's exactly the same way as well. If you're going to build an automated trading system, you start with something really simple that trades one thing in one way. You get that working, you test it, you know, you, you run it with real money, you make sure it's not doing anything crazy. And only then you think about adding other things onto it. Um, so, you know, the mistake most people do is they just start with a huge cloud of things and, you know, they don't really know what they're doing and, and they're just throwing stuff in and oh, look, this, this is amazing, this works. And, you know, they just do not want to understand what they're doing. The kind of trading system that, that a beginner is trading should be something that they, they could put together in an Excel spreadsheet and, you know, run with a pocket calculator if they had to, it should be that simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, when, you know, Rob, I, I mentioned to you off camera, Um, I was, you know, I was a uh, poker player uh, before coming to trading and in poker, um, the, these things called solvers started to get developed, which, you know, essentially know how to play a perfect balance poker strategy. Um, and so this became the thing uh, amongst, you know, professional players is wanting to play as close to the solver's strategy as possible, but, you know, it's, it's impossible for a human to play that way, but, um, you know, understanding why it would play the way it would play was important. Otherwise you're going to mess up the strategy, um, in real time. And I, I think that's kind of where my mind goes a little bit when, you know, people are like back testing or looking through data is, you know, I think you mentioned it too, is like kind of understanding, the, the data and what it's telling you, right? Otherwise you could probably misapply it. Is it was, is that what you were, you were kind of saying? Yeah. I mean, I, I've got an extremely limited experience of poker um, to be honest. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I can imagine if I was using any kind of game strategy, I'd want to have an understanding of, 
you know so i'm 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 more familiar with say card counting um and you know i'd i'd rather use a simple high low strategy than something really complicated which as you say is hard to follow and also you don't really understand where the rules are coming from yeah, um, yeah. whereas yeah that's really uh, speaking of card counting um He's probably one of my favorite uh, traders. Um, I really enjoyed his book. Um, Ed Thorpe, are you um, are you familiar with Ed Thorpe? I am extremely familiar with Ed Thorpe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, his, his, there's another good book to read. If, as, so his book was called um, uh, Man of All Markets. Man of All Markets. Yeah. yeah. So there's another book called Fortune's Formula that that also talks about him, but also talks about some okay. other people who from the same historical context. Um, so there's this thing called the Kelly criterion, which is is the mm -hmm. formula used to find optimal leverage. Um, and um, th this book sort of talks about it in, a, in the history of it in a very accessible way and going into card counting and so on and so forth. So so yeah, that that's a, a, a big part, a, a very central idea in what I do is the Kelly criteria. So, um, and I've done a lot of kind of academic work on, um, you know, estimating the Kelly criteria in the presence of uncertainty because of, you know, you generally don't have these really neat situations where you know exactly what the odds are on the payoff is, which the formula understands. You've got to make assumptions and it's all about the effect of those assumptions. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's really fascinating. Obviously, I came across that like in poker because you got to, uh, you know, there's incomplete information. You have to estimate, you know, all these things in your head. Um, I find all that real fascinating. Um, I guess. Um, oh, yeah. Last thing I want to ask you, then we'll get you on your way. Um, you brought up uh, moving average crossovers. Um, a couple of times, is this something that um, I'm assuming sees positive expectancies is something I should look a little bit more into? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's a way of finding trends in markets. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think people get a bit too hung up on, on, on the exact best way of finding a trend. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a, you know, so I have about seven or eight different ways of finding trends and they're all like 95% correlated to be honest and they all do about as well as each other does um so um you know and i i'm the reason i can and do do that is because i'm have i'd rather have a diversified set of things rather than a single thing because i'm fully automated and you know all these strategies are free basically once they've written the code they just run um so um you know i wouldn't so i wouldn't say it's to somebody who's using say breakouts to pick up trends which is another very very valid way of doing it i wouldn't say to somebody doing that oh you must use moving averages they're so much better um the, the you know the reason i use them is is again partly historical reasons so when i was trade working at ahl that was the way we looked for trends the main way we looked for trends there were other ways as well mm -hmm. um that was eight years ago so they're probably doing something different now but but um fundamentally there's not a huge amount of difference between them um to be honest um so it's more they'll work if if trends exist in markets it's as simple oh, okay. as that um, it's not like, oh, yes, there are a magic formula that, that's got positive expectancy because there's something magic about them. A, a way of finding trends. If trends exist in markets, you will make money. Historically, trends have existed in markets. If you believe that will continue into the future, personally, I do. And there's behavioral reasons why. Um, it's essentially another form of a risk premium, going back to what I was saying earlier. So, so yeah. What's, uh, I, I'm just a quick question. I'm a structure trader, I, I use market structure and, and that sort of thing um very very basic stuff supply and demand uh what what is the and i get asked this a lot by the guys in my trading room what is your sort of most go-to uh moving average crossover what what's the simplest one for sort of shorter time frame traders uh, or is there one that you use because every time we talk about moving averages and things like that everyone's got a different one and a different crossover and what what's sort of like because i'm i'm Basically, I trade off of VWAP uh, because I know that, you know, uh, I, you know, I used to feed order flow to market makers and, you know, we'd have VWAP execution models. But um, what what is sort of the most popular or uh, the one where people will react to the most um, on these crossovers? Um, I'm going to add a lot of caveats before I answer your question. So okay, I, don't know yeah. what, I don't know what market structure is and I don't really work at short time frames. Um, uh, but having said that, um, so one one thing I think I alluded to earlier, it's generally not a good idea to use a single moving average crossover or a single anything. Ah, okay. To, to use a basket of them. Um, so the, I use ones in in on daily time frames. I use ones between two comma eight, so a two day, eight day. Okay. Um, and um, up to all the way, and I use four sixteen, eight thirty two. You can see the pattern here. Got it. All the way up to sixty four two fifty six. Um, 
and on my you know on my most expensive instruments i'll only be trading that slowest one unlike nasdaq and es i'll be using all of them because they, you know they're very cheap like i said um so if you're going to use just one then i'd probably just use the middle one of those which would be um, 1664 um okay. it also happens to be very slightly better than the others um okay. but the difference is not statistically significant um but yeah in my, in my first book where i sorry my third book where i introduce the simplest possible system which is a single trading rule and a single instrument the single trading rule i use is the 1664 day crossover um partly because well not not really because it is slightly more profitable than the others because as i said i think that's overfitting potentially um but the good because it's the middle one it means that the the likely problems caused by just choosing one are going to be reduced because it's going to be highly correlated to the ones around it because it's the one in the middle um also because it's relative relatively slow and and as long as you're not trading things that are too expensive you're not likely to get completely murdered on trading costs so Got it. you know it's it's slow enough that it's kind of protecting you from doing anything too crazy Beautiful. um so so yeah i so i personally don't would never use a single moving average crossover or a single anything because i believe yep. in diversification across systems Got it. but like i said if, if someone's starting from scratch with a single rule mm -hmm. that's the one i recommend to them for those reasons perfect thank you so much excellent rob i lied i have one more question um oh, for fine. you um and I, I hope I didn't misunderstand you. So if I did, just clear this up. So I know you're saying you you back test fifty years worth of data, maybe maybe even longer. Um, I guess like one, um, wh how why do you think that that data is relevant? And maybe that is because of your system and your testing. Um, but I, I'm curious, you know, just to I guess just hear on that, like how even data pre-internet is still relevant and I, I believe you said maybe because for behavioral reasons and i don't know if you mean like human behavioral um i guess just just talk to that yeah i do mean human behavioral reasons okay. so i don't i don't believe that the so mo most trading in markets except at short time frames is still done by humans with, with human biases um the yeah so I, I go back to about yeah about 1970 1972 um the reason being that before that the, you know the number of futures listed is small very small it's just a few weird agricultural markets so i mean you know so um that the um the gold gold standard ended in i think it was 72 so there weren't fx futures before then and all you know so you, you you only see you really see significant numbers of futures after about 1972 um so as a rule as a as a rule the the faster your trading system trades the more data points information you're going to get the less data you need to make to, to make a decision of, to make a fitting decision and the higher your sharp ratio is going to be so let's take if we take an extreme example of a high frequency trader who's trading every few milliseconds and my expectation is that that they would have a very high sharp ratio and you know the the the, the virtues of, of this world um do have very high sharp ratios they very rarely have any losing days um so my expectation is that would be very high sharp ratio but also extremely high decay so the strategies they're trading might last for a few weeks or a few months at maximum. And that means the amount of data that's used to fit them is, an, is also going to be perhaps a few months of data. So you're talking about a cycle where you're fitting data over the last six months or so, trading for one, two or three months and then having to start all over again. Um, and But that brings you very high profitability. Now you're going to imagine slowing the time scale right down to the size of time scales I'm trading, holding periods of weeks to months. So the, the sharp ratio is going to be much lower. Um, the individual sharp ratios are very low indeed. And I can only get to an adequate sharp ratio by, as I said, this massive diversification. That also means that the amount of data required for fitting becomes longer and longer and longer. And to, it becomes decades. That also means that the, the decay should be very low. Um, so if I, and, and there's an easy way of measuring that, which is to look just look at the backtest curve of any one of these systems over the last 50 years and see if anything's happened to it. And in some cases, you do very occasionally there are clear patterns. So, for example, relatively fast momentum, particularly in equity indices, stopped working after about 1990. Um, and one theory behind that is you can say, well, it never really worked. Um, it, it just looked like it worked. But actually, if, if you were properly, if you're using the trading cost you're actually paying at the time, you know, the effect would have disappeared. It's only it looks like it works because I'm taking today's trading costs and extrapolating sure. them backwards. 
you know, inaccurate. Um, and the the you know the reduction in trading costs and equities has probably been an order of magnitude bigger than any other asset class. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an exception. Generally speaking, you know, if you look at the slower momentum, they 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 I mean, every few years someone says, "Oh, momentum hasn't worked for the last few years," and then and then you know, then last year happens and it's it's all fine again. And that's just what you'd expect over long periods of time. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about knowing when your system has stopped working. You've got to look at your back test and see just how bad things are in versus what they were in the past um excuse me so yeah i'm using as much data as possible because i'm trading relatively slowly mm -hmm. quite low sharp ratio and, and that sort of all ties together um and um if i was to, as i said yeah if i was to move into a domain where i was trading much more quickly then yes i could i'd expect to use less data because the, the systems would be decaying much faster and yeah i couldn't i couldn't assume that a high frequency trading system that worked in 1972 would work today that is insane but i do believe the same basic behavioral drivers of momentum that worked in 1972 will still work today and if i look at the back test it shows consistent performance across all of those decades and in fact some people have gone back even further some people have got you know hundreds of years of data um, and, and tested with that and they're still seeing the same thing so that does seem like a fairly consistent effect yeah awesome thank you thanks for that that's a great great info there so that's going to conclude today's episode of confessions of a market maker if you guys enjoyed this podcast Please rate and review it for us. If you'd like to join a supportive and professional community of traders, you can join us at microefutures.com. Rob, uh, let the listeners know where they can find you um, and anything else you want them to know. Uh, my main website is systematicmoney.org. Um, from there, you can find links to my blog, to my GitHub page, which is you can, where you can download my trading system and use it yourself, uh, and also my Twitter and other social media. Mm -hmm. when's the uh when's the book coming out rob i believe it's april the 23rd awesome awesome how how long how long did that book take you well it's it's 650 pages so <laughs> yeah it's i had, I had hair before i started writing no i didn't um yeah i mean probably about i think i started writing it in in like november december 2021 so um about nine or ten months of writing and then the last few months and also the next couple of months has been about you know just revising and uh editing and stuff like that so so yeah let's call it a year it was a round number pretty impressive guys yeah. go out get his get his book um go get the other books read his blog I, I i thoroughly enjoyed um reading it a lot of great stuff on there uh jj pardon words oh thanks so much for coming and uh you know sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us we really appreciate it no yep. problem. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys. All right. So for Rob Carver, I'm Paulie Walnuts. He's the grill of House Street. Make sure you're using stops, though.